previously on Welcome to Nexium. We spoke about Keith Raniere's childhood and early adulthood, where he developed a habit of grooming and sexually abusing underage girls and children. We spoke about Nancy Salzman, who was a hypnotherapist and neurolinguistics programming expert and the co-founder of Nexium. We covered the foundations of Nexium and the countless different courses Nexium offered, and the way that Keith used the company to create compliant, devoted followers out of its members, and the mysterious and deeply unsettling deaths of both Gina Hutchinson and Kristen Snyder. Today, we're going to uncover the groundbreaking event that led to the creation of DOS, a secret subgroup of sex slaves within Nexium. What life was like for a DOS slave and the gradual ramp up of the group that led to women being branded like cattle. And finally, the eventual downfall of Nexium and Keith Raniere. Welcome back to Nexium. I got to admit, I feel a bit like Jack Bauer on 24 doing these previously. Hello, hello, all you lovely individuals. Welcome back to Welcome to Nexium. If you haven't seen the previous Welcome to Nexiums, then <laughs> what are you doing with your life? I'm, of course, just kidding. I will leave links up here and down below so that you can pause this video and catch up. And I'll just wait here patiently until you're ready to start the series final. The series final. I can't believe it. Are you guys excited? As usual, I have included timestamps in the description down below. So if you are looking for something specific or I am just going on and on and on about something that is truly boring to you, then feel free to just skip through. I am terrified about how long this video is going to be because we have a lot to cover. So I highly, highly recommend you go grab some snacks so you don't die of starvation while watching this video. As usual, we have the beautiful Lily girl here to emotionally and mentally support us. Editing Liz, let's switch to Lily Cam. Lily, you ready? Are you really ready? Are you sure? Okay. And with all of that housekeeping out of the way, let's continue our journey. So we left off in 2003 in the last video when Forbes released their scathing article on Nexium and Keith Raniere. And the article did leave a little bit of a dink in the company and more importantly, Keith's pride. But by this point, Nexium was already a big company. It had a lot of followers, so it didn't exactly sink the ship. Luckily for Forbes, they're a pretty big deal, pretty untouchable. Otherwise, Keith might have handled them in the same way he dealt with other negative press and naysayers, burying them in legal fees, lawsuits, and litigation. It's been said in the past that Keith Raniere would have gladly spent $5 million just to punish someone for speaking ill of Nexium which is kind of easy to do when it's not your money because, of course, as you'll remember, Keith was being bankrolled by the Bromfin sisters. Examples of this included Nexium suing cult expert Rick Ross in late 2003 when he posted excerpts from one of their training manuals on the Ross Institute website and referred to Nexium classes as expensive brainwashing. The court ruled in Ross's favour, but this was just the beginning of over 14 years of harassment of Ross at the hands of a spiteful Keith Ranieri. Ross claims that as well as other legal battles that Keith unleashed against him, Nexium members stalked him, went through his garbage, and went so far as to set up a phony intervention for a phony client on a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean. Luckily, Ross was clued in and didn't attend because who knows what Keith and his followers had planned for him on that ship. But he says during this period, he was quite often in fear for his life. There's also Frank Pilato, who was hired as a publicist for Nexium in 2007 to help with their image, but he was fired in 2008 for writing multiple exposés on the group on his website, The Frank Report. You know, just like the opposite of what Keith had hired him for. Keith Ranieri and Claire Bronfman sued Frank, saying that he had stolen $1 million from the Bronfman sisters. Frank was later criminally charged with defrauding the Bronfman sisters and the 
the IRS. But after fighting these charges for years and years, Frank to this day still claims that he was innocent, that he was framed by Keith Raniere and his followers as punishment for speaking out against them. And this was a pattern that we would see continued for years. Someone would try and blow the whistle on Nexium or warn people about Keith Raniere and they would be faced with just an avalanche of lawsuits and surveillance and harassment that quite often would force them into silence. And in the end, after watching this happen to so many people, Nexium followers that had an issue with the company or Keith Raniere just became afraid to talk and there was no good way for them to leave Nexium either. There was no amicable parting of ways, no, well, it's been a swell ride, guys, but I'm going to just go now. Catch you later. No, if you left Nexium, you faced constant harassment to return and you would potentially be surveilled by private investigators that would be working super hard to dig up dirt on you that they could use against you in the instance that you dared breathe a word to anyone about your experience in the company. So Nexium, by the skin of its goddamn teeth, managed to uphold its image of a semi-reputable self-help organization for a good number of years despite the cult rumors that haunted it. Keith helped this along with a concentrated effort to recruit a handful of celebrities like Sarah Edmondson, Nikki Klein, India Oxenberg, and Grace Park. But the most high-profile snag, the ultimate jewel in Keith's crown, was of course Alison Mack. In 2006, Alison Mack attended a two-day introduction seminar to Jeunesse held in Vancouver. And you guys remember Jeunesse, of course, where women were told they were impulsive and flighty and that they shouldn't mess with their man's divine right to spread his seed. Yeah, that, that Jeunesse. That's the one. Alison was 23 years old, and at this point in her career, she had a few decent acting roles under her belt, but she was most well known, of course, for her role in the TV show Smallville, where she played the spunky, lovable fan favorite Chloe Sullivan. Smallville's fifth season was just beginning to air when her co star, Kristen Crook, invited her along to the two day workshop. When Keith found out that Alison was going to be at the seminar, he allegedly told his followers to roll out the red carpet for her, to give her special treatment, you know, razzle-dazzle her in an obvious attempt to recruit her. Nancy Salzman was speaking at this event and afterwards she sent her daughter Lauren Salzman out to speak to Alison. Lauren was also heavily involved in Nexium, and Lauren invited Alison on a trip on their private jet to Albany to meet Keith Raniere in the flesh, telling her that he could impart some personalized wisdom that would surely help her progress in her acting career. Can you feel the thirst? They were thirsty. This was apparently very appealing to Alison, who had always been insecure about not attending college and, according to her own blog, had a tendency to call herself stupid. So she took Lauren up on her offer and flew with her to Albany to meet Keith Raniere. And a few weeks later, she was still there, soaking up Keith's wisdom and teachings. According to those that knew her, Alison thought that she had found a mentor in Keith Raniere, someone that could help her cope with the intimidating and overwhelming fame that her role in Smallville had brought her, someone that could guide her and help her add value to her life beyond that fame. Sadly for Alison, Keith Raniere was only drawn to her because of her fame and the potential Eventually he saw to use her to change Nexium's image. See, Nexium were tired of being unfairly demonized by the media, and they'd been taking notes from Scientology's publicity tactics, and Keith was determined that Allison was going to be their Tom Cruise. So she magically ascended through the ranks of the Stripe Path, becoming Proctor in 2015, and the president of the Source, where Nexium members could work on their public speaking and performance skills. I mean, 
Alison Mack truly became Nexium's golden child. She became the celebrity face of the company. They began an advertising campaign. I'm sure some of you guys have seen the videos where Alison and Keith casually sit down and just chat about what a genius he was and all the things that Nexium and Keith Raniere had to offer the world. And Alison sits there and gushes about all the things he's done for her. And people were watching and were just like, uh, Nexium's not so bad. I mean, they're weird, but let them do them. So it was mostly smooth sailing for a while until April 2009 when a bunch of high-ranking women within Nexium gathered together and requested a meeting with Keith to discuss some of the concerns they had with how the company was being run. This group would later commonly be known as the Nexium Nine, and they sat Keith down and said that they knew that some dodgy things had been happening at Nexium, like tax evasion and a lack of transparency in its business dealings. But what they were most concerned about was that a large portion of the executive board of Nexium was made up by Keith's inner circle, like his harem. Remember the women that he was sleeping with and that all lived and breathed for him? Now, usually an executive board exists to make sure that a company and those in charge are all doing the right thing, that its finances are all in order and squeaky clean, and just literally to make sure that everything is above board. But Sneaky Keith had created the perfect setting where he was never going to be called out on shit. His authority was never going to be questioned because he controlled the executive board with the intimacy he had with these women who adored him. They were never going to call him out. Now, none of the women that made up the Nexium 9 wanted to leave Nexium. They just wanted to speak with Keith and attempt to better what they thought thought was a great company doing great things for people. But Keith refused to take any of their constructive criticisms or suggestions on board, and the meeting turned into an 11-hour standoff, during which Keith told these women that he had had people killed for his beliefs. Is anyone remembering Gina Hutchinson and Kristen Snyder right now? I'm just saying. The standoff lasted with all nine women resigning from Nexium, and they later sent Keith Raniere, Nancy Salzman and the executive board a joint resignation letter. In the letter, they requested payments owed to them for things like commission and training fees because just like CBI back in the day, Nexium had developed the habit of not paying its staff. The total amount owed to the women was roughly $2.1 million, and the letter said that if they did not receive the payment within a certain amount of time, they would have no choice but to go to the press and expose Nexium and its dodgy business practices. Keith's response was to sincerely apologize to the women and give them the money that they were owed. <laughs> Can you imagine? No. Keith's response was to play the victim card again. Guys, get with it. He sat down his senior followers and told them that these evil women were trying to tear the company apart and extort money from Nexium, and he had no choice but to press criminal charges against all of them. But what he didn't say is that these women's real crime was to shake Keith's belief in the absolute control he thought he had over these people. These had been women that Keith had truly thought he had under his thumb, that they would do anything and and everything he demanded of them. And instead they had blindsided him. They had had the nerve to question him and his methods. So despite the calm face he put on for his remaining followers, his blood was boiling. Now the extortion charges never stuck because these women weren't trying to extort Nexium. They were just asking for the money owed to them, but that did not stop them from being tied up in court for years with the civil suits that Keith Raniere rained down upon them like hellfire. One of the women, Barbara Boucher, who had actually been a longtime girlfriend of Keith's, could hardly find anyone to defend her because at the time there was a lot of press surrounding Nexium and Keith Raniere, 
and it was actually positive for once. Keith had managed with a lot of help from the Bronfman sisters to wrangle a meeting with the Dalai Lama, who was making a controversial visit to Albany specifically to endorse Keith Raniere and Nexium. The visit had been cancelled at one point because people had been speaking to His Holiness saying, um... Do you know who Keith Raniere is? But Keith, the Bronfman sisters, and a few other Nexium leaders flew to Dharamasala in India to beg the Dalai Lama to change his mind. And allegedly, the Bronfman sisters paid him a sweet one meal to reconsider, which he did. But you did not hear that from me. So the Dalai Lama flew to Albany and met with Keith Raniere and gave him his blessing. Back to the Nexium 9, some of these lawsuits against them took several years to be dismissed, and as a result, some of them needed to declare bankruptcy after paying the legal fees to defend themselves all that time. Some of them hadn't been able to work because defending themselves in court against Keith Raniere and Nexium became their full-time job, and this was all while knowing that there was no end in sight thanks to Keith's access to the Bronfman sisters' deep pockets. Barbara Boucher says that it took seven years for her to pay off her $700,000 legal debt, and a lot of the women's circumstances weren't too different to this. Keith, meanwhile, was desperately scrambling to regain some of that perceived ultimate control he thought he had, and his confidence had been shaken, guys. He needed to do something quick to prove to himself that he still had that ultimate power that he craved. So when he heard that a girl in Nexium known only to the public as Daniela had a crush on another man in Nexium and that they had kissed... Keith jumped on the opportunity to seize back control. This girl, Daniela, and her family, including her parents and three siblings, had all moved from Mexico to Albany in 2005 to be part of Nexium. Daniela testified later in court that in the years she was in Albany, while she was still an underage girl, she was groomed for a sexual relationship with Keith Ranieri. And this grooming involved her losing a certain amount of weight because, as I'm sure you've picked up from his history, Keith had a penchant for exceptionally thin women and girls. Daniela and Keith ended up having sex days before her 18th birthday, and Keith was 40 years old at the time. Just to make this even more horrific, Daniela would also testify that Keith had sex with both of her sisters as well, one of whom was only 15 years old at the time, and that at one point or another, all three sisters had been pregnant to Keith and all three sisters had been pressured to have abortions by Keith because he wanted to maintain his image of being celibate. Supposedly, all of the women that had sex with Keith, including Daniela, were forced to make a vow that they would only be intimate with Keith and Keith alone for the rest of their lives. So when Keith found out that Daniela had kissed another man, this was another blow to his ego and control, and he was not having it. As punishment, Daniela was held prisoner for two years in a room in the same house where her family lived. All she was allowed in the room during this time was a bed to sleep on and a pen and notebook that she was instructed to use to write Keith daily letters. Daniela's parents were not aware that Keith had slept with any of their daughters, and Keith repeatedly told them that Daniela had... <laughs> committed a ethical breach on par with killing a child. They were told to not speak with her at all. So during these two years, they would leave food at her door but not acknowledge her in any way. The only one that did acknowledge Daniela during this time was Lauren Salzman, Nancy Salzman's daughter, who oversaw her imprisonment. And she would occasionally come to the house and offer Daniela coaching to see if she had fixed her ethical breach and threatened to leave her at the Mexican border with no papers or money if she didn't. The ultimate psychological control trick that Keith used during this imprisonment was leaving the door unlocked the entire time, almost as if this was a game he was playing to prove to himself he was still 
in control. This imprisonment, of course, had dire effects on Daniela and her mental state. And she testified that one day she had actually decided to kill herself when she got a glimpse of a bird and its babies in a nest just outside her window. And she changed her mind. That was the day she finally stepped foot out of the room and was promptly ushered out of Albany by Nexium staff to the Mexican border, where she was left with no papers or money, just as Lauren Salzman had repeatedly threatened. But apparently this still wasn't enough of a display of ultimate control for the power-hungry Keith. I mean, you guys know it's going to get a lot worse, right? So over the years, as I mentioned, Alice and Mac had been rapidly progressing through the stripe path. She was heavily involved in the advertising content they were pumping out, and she was super close with Keith Ranieri. If you were a woman in Nexium, you probably saw Alison as the pretty popular cheerleader in high school that was always surrounded by admirers and that would never ever dream in a million years of speaking to the likes of you. You were just a lowly student or a coach, just struggling to make your way in Nexium. You were working more hours than you had ever worked in your life and doing this with little to no payoff or progression because that's the way Nexium was designed. And to top it off, you were doing this on very little sleep. And then one day, you look up from your lunch and there she freaking is, Alison Mack in the flesh. And Alison smiles at you and tells you she notices how hard you're working, but she can see that there's just something holding you back. She says that there is this secret kick-ass group that no one else knows about, but she thinks that you would be a really good fit for, and that this group could be the key to you progressing further in Nexium. The group was like a secret society run completely by women. Not even Keith knew about it. And it was all about women empowering women in a really deep way. So thinking, oh my God, Alison Mack chose me. You, of course, jump at the opportunity of saying, yes, I'm in. But Alison says, well, I really want to tell you more about it. But like I said, it's top secret. No one in Nexium can know about it. So I need you to prove to me somehow that you're not going to tell anyone. I know. Why don't you give me something important to you, like collateral, so that I can know for sure you're not going to tell? Alarm bells go off in your head. Collateral? And Allison is like, oh, it's, it's no big deal. Just like the password to your Facebook or a nude photo or, I don't know, like a secret about your family that no one else knows. If she senses you're hesitating, she reasons, well, if you trusted your word, you would put this collateral down with no problem, knowing it would never see the light of day. Maybe that's what's holding you back. Maybe you don't trust yourself. That's why you're failing at Nexium. Feeling this great opportunity slip through your fingers, you think quick and agree. You send that pic or that password or that secret and you're in. You're in DOS or Dominus Obsequious Sororium, which translates roughly from Latin to Dominant Submissive Sorority. Of course, the true nature of this group was only revealed to these women once they had already handed over their compromising collateral. Once in, they were told that they were now a slave and they had entered in a lifelong commitment of total obedience to their master, but that this commitment was going to empower them, that giving over total control of your life was the only way to truly let go and be free to live your life the way you were meant to. Besides, you were already a slave to your fears and inhibitions. Wouldn't you rather be a slave to something noble that aligns with your values? DOS slaves were expected to do anything their masters asked of them, which mostly included errands like cooking and cleaning and running to the store. They were also expected to check in with their masters several times a day, starting from when they open their eyes in the morning to when they close their eyes at night. At some point, they would find out that their master had other slaves and that together these slaves made a pod and that they should think of the other slaves in their pod as their sisters. They might also find out that their master had a master and that they should refer to this woman as their grandmaster. So 
Just like Nexium, the DOS system took a definite pyramid shape. DOS slaves were put on a very restrictive diet, most likely around the 500 calorie mark and a very demanding exercise schedule. It was said that losing weight was the clearest way for you to see your limitations and the ultimate practice of self-restraint and discipline. Slaves needed to ask their master for every calorie, every morsel of food needed to be measured out documented and approved before they could eat it. These women were literally starving. Their hair was falling out. They weren't getting their periods. But if they went to their masters with their concerns, they would just be told, well, that's happened to me when I've gone on a diet. It's no big deal. At the end of each day, slaves needed to fill out a journal where they listed all of their failures from that day, be it going over their calorie allowance, sleeping in, not meeting their exercise goals, or not being submissive enough to their master. And if the failure was serious enough, it would be labeled a breach and there would be a penance to be paid. The penance could be fasting for a day or standing for an hour at 4 a.m., or needing to ask their master for permission for every text they sent out. A lot of the slaves were also required to give monthly collateral on top of the collateral they had given to join DOS. And this collateral was intense. Like there were deeds to houses. There was access to bank accounts. One woman that had run out of collateral to give submitted a recording of herself lying, saying that her husband had beat their two-year-old son. Another woman wrote a letter to her parents saying she was a prostitute, also a lie. But the collateral was held over these women's heads and they knew that if they ever stepped out of line or told anyone what was happening, that it would be released. If you're sitting there trying to think of the term for this, let me help you out. It's blackmail and it's illegal. So life for a DOS slave was very intense and stressful to say the least. And that was before the day that their master might come to them and say that they had an assignment for them. And this assignment would require a lot of trust, but would ultimately help them grow. And that assignment was to seduce Keith Ranieri. Now, I'm sure these women were appalled and incredibly uncomfortable with this assignment, but they also believed the lie that Keith Ranieri had told his followers for years that he was celibate. So they probably thought that the worst thing that was going to happen to them was that they would come on to Keith and he would deny them and they would just be mortified and humiliated. And that would be the lesson over. So imagine their horror when they found that this wasn't the case, that Keith reciprocated their awkward advances and actually had sex with them. Like, can you imagine how shocked and traumatized these women must have been? They were also required to take a naked photo of Keith or have Keith take a naked photo of them to prove that the assignment had been completed. And they would get that same assignment of having sex with Keith again and again and again, all the while being threatened that their collateral would be released if they said no. It seems like it was 2016 where the stakes were really raised to new heights for DOS slaves. They were under intense pressure from their masters to recruit more slaves. And of course, some of the women tried to resist. Who would want to bring another unsuspecting victim into DOS and have them go through the same terrible things? But if they didn't hit their targets, they would be forced to undergo harsher and harsher penances, which now included corporal punishment in the form of paddling and whipping. They would also be forced to take part in countless EMs, and they were told that they were recruiting these women for their own good. Why wouldn't they want to help these women in the way that they had been helped? It was also around this time that masters started taking their pods of slaves on weekend trips and the slaves were told that this was to bring them closer together and tighten their bonds of sisterhood. But they were also told that this girl's trip was not just for fun. 
Now, each account is a little different, but basically on the final night of this getaway, the slaves would be blindfolded and driven to a location that was unknown to them. This location was later revealed to be Alison Mack's house in Albany. Once there, they would be told to remove all of their clothes and they were told that they were going to be taking part in a ceremony that would basically cement their loyalty to DOS. And this ceremony was going to involve getting branded. The women were told that the brand was going to be very small and made up of lines that represented the elements, air, water, and earth. Fire, of course, was going to be represented by the cauterizing pen that was going to burn the design into their skin. The ceremony was filmed and began with the woman about to be branded saying the words, Master, would you brand me? It would be an honor. She was then led naked and blindfolded to lay down on a table where she was held down by her fellow slaves, also naked. And then the branding would begin. The branding process took place without any anesthesia and took about 30 minutes to complete. Up to seven women were branded at a time, so these women would have to listen to the others scream and cry for hours while they held them down, the smell of burning flesh filling their noses, all the while knowing that their turn was coming up soon. The brand itself was placed just above the women's pubic area and in actuality was a lot larger than what they had been told it was going to be. I'm now going to place an up-close image of one of the brands up in the screen. So if that's something you don't wish to see, I strongly suggest you look away for a couple of seconds. According to reports of the roughly 150 women that had been recruited to DOS, 13 of them had been branded before the pyramid that was DOS began to crumble, starting an unstoppable avalanche that would lead to the demise of Keith Raniere and Nexium itself. It was the 5th of June 2017 that the general public were first alerted to the brandings via Frank Pilato's website, The Frank Report, and this was the first time that Keith Raniere was accused of being the mastermind behind DOS. Both DOS members and Nexium members, of course, saw the story, and a lot of DOS slaves began to defect, having had no idea that Keith Raniere had been behind DOS all along, that rather than the group being about women empowering women, it had actually all just been a scheme to manipulate them into having sex with Keith Raniere. Nexium members were even more stunned. They had had no idea that DOS even existed, let alone that it was branding their women. But Frank Pilato had been demonized and labeled as suppressive within the Nexium community due to him calling Keith out on his website for years. So while a lot of Nexium members did leave, a lot of them stayed behind simply unable to believe this outlandish story and the idea that their leader, their perfect celibate leader, could ever be capable of such horrific things. The ones that stayed were told that they were the true believers and that they were now being faced with a test that would prove their loyalty to Nexium. And then on the 17th of October 2017, the New York Times just... <laughs> you know, casually dropped an article entitled Inside a Secretive Group Where the Women Are Branded. And right there before their very eyes was the actress turned DOS slave, Sarah Edmondson, lowering the waistband of her jeans to reveal her brand. This was earth shattering, like not just for Nexium, who of course suffered a mass exodus, but also for the rest of the world. Suddenly people weren't just like, well, Let Nexium do Nexium. They were like, what the fuck? And the difference between this time and all the other times that people had tried to stand up against Nexium in the press was that Sarah Edmondson was unfreaking touchable. Everyone had seen the picture. She had become literally the face of DOS. And if Keith Raniere and the Bronfman sisters tried to just bury her in lawsuits like they usually would, the public was not going to stand for it. 
And now, finally, the authorities were taking notice. An investigation began into Nexium and Keith Ranieri, and a case was being built, but it was all kept very hush-hush, so as not to spook Keith and give him the opportunity to flee. Keith released a public letter to the remaining Nexium members saying that he had had no involvement in DOS whatsoever and that it was absolutely not a part of Nexium. But he did eventually catch wind of the pending investigation against him and he fled to Mexico in late 2017, holding up in a $10,000 a week luxury villa there, paid very generously by some high-ranking Nexium followers he had there. His followers back in Albany were told that Keith had just had to leave for his own protection, but in February 2018, a warrant was issued for his arrest. And can I just say that during this time, DOS was still running. It was business as usual for the women that had chosen to stay. Like penances, weight recording, calorie counting had been going on this entire time. Alison Mack at this point had also fled Albany and she was hiding out in her apartment in Brooklyn. But she and a handful of other high-ranking DOS slaves, including Nikki Klein and Lauren Salzman, were called to Mexico to meet with Keith and take part in a recommitment ceremony. This ceremony was essentially just going to be all of them pleasuring Keith at the same time. Like seriously, he's on the run from the law and all he can think about is sex. I mean, seriously, priorities, Keith. Come on. In March of 2018, on the day the ceremony was supposed to take place, Mexican federal police armed with machine guns stormed the luxury villa. And while the other women were lined up and handcuffed outside, Lauren Salzman and Keith Ranieri ran upstairs to hide. As police banged on the door of the room they were hiding in, Lauren later testified in court that Keith told her to ask if they had a warrant and then promptly barricaded himself in the walk-in robe, leaving Lauren to fend for herself. Mexican police found Keith Ranieri cowering in the closet he was hiding in and he was arrested. The charges against him included sex trafficking and attempted sex trafficking, sexual exploitation of a child and possession of child pornography, identity theft, trafficking for labor and services as well as forced labor, racketeering and racketeering conspiracy, and wire fraud conspiracy. For these charges, he faced the possibility of life in prison. Alison Mack was arrested on the 20th of April 2018 by the FBI at her Brooklyn apartment and charged with sex trafficking, sex trafficking conspiracy, and forced labor conspiracy. At her arraignment proceedings, Alison Mack was also accused of entering a fraudulent marriage with her fellow DOS slave, Nikki Klein, in an attempt to help Klein, who was a Canadian, gain access to a US visa. On the 24th of April 2018, Alison was released on a $5 million bond and held under house arrest at her parents' house in California. While she had originally pled not guilty to all charges, she eventually had a change of heart and worked with authorities to build their case against Keith Ranieri. On the 8th of April 2019, Alison Mack pled guilty to racketeering and racketeering conspiracy. She tearfully told the court that she had always believed that Keith's intention had been to help people, but she realized she had been wrong and she now had to take full responsibility for her conduct. Alison is still awaiting sentencing due to delays with COVID-19, but she faces a maximum sentence of 40 years in prison. Nancy Salzman, Lauren Salzman, and a woman named Kathy Russell, who was an accountant for Nexium were all arrested on the 24th of July 2018 and charged with racketeering conspiracy. Nancy and Lauren also cooperated with authorities. They both pled guilty to racketeering and are both on house arrest awaiting their sentences like Allison. Nancy faces a maximum of 20 years in prison and Lauren faces a maximum of 40 years in prison. Claire Bronfman was also arrested on the 24th of July the same day as the Salzmans, and she was charged with money laundering and identity theft. She paid her $100 million bail two days later and was placed on house arrest. But unlike the others, she refused to work with authorities. She refused to turn her back on Keith Ranieri and Nexium. 
loyal to the bitter end. She ended up pleading guilty for conspiracy to conceal and harbor illegal immigrants for financial gain and fraudulent use of identification. The prosecution requested that the judge sentence Claire to five years jail time and a $6 million fine for these crimes. But on the 30th of September, 2020, Claire was actually sentenced to six years, nine months jail time, and a $500,000 fine. And we're back to Keith Ranieri. On the 4th of May, 2018, he pled not guilty to all charges, and he was denied bail because it was very clear that Claire Bronfman would have paid whatever it was set at, and that Keith was a serious flight risk. Keith's trial began a year later on the 7th of May, 2019, and during his trial, Audio recordings were played of Keith speaking with Alison Mack and other DOS members that proved what Frank Pilato had claimed all along. That Keith Ranieri, the man that had sworn up and down that he had had no involvement or knowledge of DOS, was actually the very evil mastermind behind its creation. That he had had a very active part in the planning of every single detail of how the group would be run including the branding ceremonies. In the recordings played to the court, Keith was heard saying that the women should ask to be branded so that it didn't seem like they were being coerced and that this should happen before they were held down naked on a table like a sacrifice. Keith also revealed in the recordings the true meaning behind the brands. And just a friendly warning again, I am going to show up close pictures of the brands, so look away if you don't want to see it. These brands, of course, were not inspired by the elements at all, but in fact were a combination of Keith Ranieri's initials, KR, and Alison Mack's initials, AM. Okay, it's safe. You can open your eyes again now. Keith's lawyers argued at the trial that everything that had happened within Nexium and DOS was completely consensual, but that while these women had originally consented, they were now just being typical women and were all bitter at Keith. And that just like in a divorce, these women were now rethinking everything, thinking, well, maybe I was coerced. Maybe I was brainwashed. I don't know. I'm just a flighty, obnoxious woman that doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. I mean... <laughs> I'd say I was in awe that they came up with such a condescending and misogynistic defense, but then I remember they were defending Keith Ranieri. On the 19th of June, 2019, after deliberating for just four hours, the jury found Keith guilty on all charges. In the time leading up to his sentencing, a group calling themselves We Are As You started dancing outside Brooklyn's Metropolitan Detention Centre where Keith was being held. Although the group never admitted to being there for Keith, it was made up of quite a few high-ranking members of Nexium, including Nikki Klein, and they were often seen holding signs with supportive messages for someone called Kay Rose, even though there was no prisoner there called Kay Rose. But you know who has the same initials as K Rose? That's right, you genius. Keith Ranieri. Keith was eventually moved to another jail cell where he wouldn't be able to see the dancers. And not long after this, the dancers stopped showing up. On the 27th of October, 2020, Keith Ranieri was sentenced to, drum roll please, 120 years in prison. His earliest possible release date is the 27th of June, 2120, when Keith will be 160 years old. Basically, he's never getting out, guys. Keith is currently serving his sentence at the Maximum Security Prison, United States Penitentiary, Tucson in Arizona, but somehow... He still has a hold over his few remaining loyal followers. Although Nexium announced on the 12th of June 2018 that they would be suspending all operations, SOP meetings were still taking place in late 2020. There are whispers that Nexium is still alive and well, and that Keith is still very in control of the group 
delegating commands from his jail cell. It was revealed in February of this year that Keith and his lawyers are actively planning to appeal his conviction on the grounds that he did not receive a fair trial. Last month, one of Keith's defense attorneys, Danielle Smith, removed herself not only from his case, but from her law firm. And this was one day after it was revealed that the full names and medical information of a number of Keith's victims had accidentally been made public by his lawyers due to a technical error. And that, ladies and gentlemen, pretty much brings us up to date on how the case stands today. But how are you guys feeling? Is everyone okay? Because I honestly don't know if I'm okay, if I'll ever be okay. I have so many thoughts and feelings reeling through my head about this case. So I wanted to kind of finish up this series with a final thought section, and then we can discuss everything in more detail in the comments down below. So welcome to final thoughts. I will start with what I feel is the most controversial thought I've been chewing on during these videos, and I don't know how to broach this topic without ruffling a lot of people's feathers, but I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to get it out there. I don't know how I feel about Alison Mack being charged with sex trafficking. I said what I said. Like, I know she was able to dodge the charge by cooperating with authorities. And there's part of me that's like, well, yeah, duh, she should have been charged. She did some terrible things. She victimized so many women. But then the other part of me is like, she was so victimized and abused by Keith Raniere. She was so under his coercive control. She was essentially the first DOS slave. Before Keith was even arrested, she did an interview with the New York Times where she claimed that the brandings were entirely her idea. Like, I'm not trying to defend anything she did. She did some terrible things. But I do feel like she was so indoctrinated and brainwashed by Keith Raniere that without those audio recordings that were played in court that proved that Keith had planned everything about DOS, that Alison would have taken the fall for Keith for everything in a heartbeat. And I feel like she's definitely not the only case where the lines are blurred between victim and victimizer. Like there's Lauren Salzman, there's Sarah Edmondson. Um, if you've seen the documentary Seduced, there's India Oxenberg. Like I don't, if I'm completely honest, I don't know if I'm being too sympathetic, but it's very difficult for me to personally decide how much blame should be placed on these women's shoulders. Next thought. One thing I found very disturbing during my research was the lack of press coverage on Nexium in Mexico, because it's very clear that Keith had a very large and loyal following there. But it was really hard to find any information about the centers there or the members other than the high ranking ones or any other victims other than the ones that testified in court, despite the fact that a large number of DOS slaves were from Mexico. Another thought, how are we feeling about Nancy Salzman? Because I feel like her involvement and knowledge of DOS has been severely downplayed. I feel like she had to have known about it. Her daughter was one of the highest ranking members. And if she did know about it, how did she let her daughter be involved in something like that? Was her moral compass that off? Was she that under Keith Raniere's spell as well? You would think being a hypnotherapist and a neurolinguistics programming expert that she would be immune to it. And finally, guys, Keith Raniere's total lack of remorse or sympathy for his victims. He did a interview from prison with NBC and of all people, Frank Pilato, who originally blew the whistle on the brandings. And Keith said in the interview that a horrible injustice had occurred but not for his victims, but for him. He still maintains his innocence and says that he's been severely mistreated by the justice system. You know, just Keith Raniere back at it with the ultimate victim card. But what do you guys think? Is there anything else you're still struggling to come to terms with in regards to Keith Raniere or Nexium or DOS? Let me know in the comments down below and we can talk about it.
And we did it, guys. We made it to the end of Welcome to Nexium. You now know more about Keith Raniere and Nexium and DOS than the average person should. But we can all get on with our lives now. I truly hope you guys enjoyed this series. Thank you so much for sticking it out with me and hanging out with me. As usual, I really appreciate it. Uh, Princess Lily would, of course, like to say goodbye. <laughs> Come on, Princess. Hello. What? You haven't been fed in a whole hour? <laughs> <gasps> Don't you touch the tree. <laughs> Okay, give me one second. I'll see you guys in the next video when we will be talking about something other than Keith Raniere. I hope you have the best week of all time. Bye.